Okay. Um, so, hello, I'm Stephen, and this is CVW and the quest for 60 FPS. Uh, there's going to be daring feats of bravery, and there's going to be thrills, and there's going to be a whole lot of Chrome developer tools. So, let's meet our adventurer. Here he is, it's CVW, and if you couldn't already tell, it's, it's me, it's Stephen, Stevie, yeah, right. Uh, so it's a true story, a true story of feats of bravery and daring and cunning. And he was preparing to give a talk at any tech. Uh, quick plug, Stephen Waterman, YouTube, yep. And for that, he needed a Minesweeper game. One that let the audience participate and let them choose what to do. So he started a new React Redux app. And the progress was good, it was all going well. And Steve, he was happy. He was happy. But unfortunately, something terrible happened while he was working on the game. He was playing around with it, and he enabled the auto solver. He waited, it for, he waited for it to start solving, and then he kept waiting, and he kept waiting, and he kept, the app had frozen. Nothing was happening, and then the browser crashed. And Stevie thought to himself, well, that's embarrassing. I should optimize it. And he ignored those thoughts. It, oh, it's just gonna be too much effort. And he really didn't have time, he, was, he had a talk, it was tomorrow, and he had to add a few more features, so he just did that. A little bit of time passed, and Stevie gave his talk, he wrote a few blog posts, worked on some side projects, and just generally tried to avoid, tried to avoid actually optimising this thing. But eventually he ran out of things to procrastinate with, and he was forced to start optimising. But there was one issue, he had no idea how to optimise a web app. Alas, there was no time for depression. He was shortly interrupted by a godly vision. It was Matt Stobbs. <laughs> and he said, thanks for coming to my tech talk about Svelte. And Stevie thought, huh, that was helpful. But suddenly he had another vision, and it was robot. And he said, thanks for coming to my tech talk about web optimization. And Stevie thought, huh, that was helpful. So uh, thanks, guys. That was, are you actually in the audience? Oh, <laughs> Armed with that newfound knowledge, Stevie knew one thing for sure. It was optimization time. So the plan, it was brilliant and incredibly detailed. Step one, re-implement the app in Svelte. This is mad and tell them about how amazing Svelte was. Step two, ellipsis. <laughs> Step three, profit. It was it, it wasn't detailed. But Stevie had faith. He, he knew that Svelte was amazing and people really liked it. It's actually quite similar to a Swift UI, kind of two-way data bindings and reactivity. It's all very exciting. Um, so yeah, if we think about Svelte, there's four places in the kind of web pipeline where something could optimize for. You could optimize for writing uh, in a way that it kind of lets you write bigger and more complex projects without getting bogged down in the details. And both Svelte and React help with that. Uh, they could help improve compiling speed. And Svelte is actually bad at that. It slows you down in the compilation stage because it adds an extra compilation step, the same way that Babel or TypeScript do to add more features to JavaScript. <coughs> Meanwhile, React is purely runtime, so it has no effect. But when it gets to the bits that are actually running on the client machines, whether that's their phones or their rubbish computers from 2004, it's fast, which is what we want, because their machines are going to be the ones that are struggling. So Svelte has no runtime libraries, which means nothing to download and no overhead for running that code compared to React, which is really slow and makes you cry. So Stevie thought that sounded perfect. He jumped on his computer and loaded up a new Svelte project and wrote a Minesweeper solver, pretty much the same as the one he did for any tech. So let's have a look at that now. Wow, magic. So, there might be quite a lot of refreshing here because it is pretty much just random chance when it's actually going to be able to solve it and then we can demo it. Uh, I would have made this work a bit better. Here we go. It doesn't look like it's doing much, but that's because it's not very fast. Just around here, you can see it kind of slowly work its way out and solve this Minesweeper. Uh, solve the Minesweeper board. We'll just ignore that one. <laughs> cool. So he'd done it. He'd written it in Svelte and he knew it was going to be great, but it wasn't. Uh, he thought, well, that's embarrassing. He'd rewritten it from scratch in a performance-first web framework, and it reached an astonishing 1.9 FPS. <laughs> Admittedly, it didn't crash the browser, it didn't crash the tab, it didn't freeze, so that was a good improvement. And that was 100 by 100, it's quite big. 
the only tech one crashed if you went above about 15 by 15. But where are those FPS? <laughs> Looking at developer tools, he was horrified at what he saw in the performance tab. It was this weird box shape with lots of small boxes, and then there were multiple colors. But he Googled it, and then he started to understand that he was a bit less scared. Um, so it's like a timeline from left to right. Uh, so the app kind of starts on the left, and all of this yellow and blue is JavaScript code running. As we go further down, it's kind of deeper into that call stack. At the very end here, after six seconds of computation, it, it produces one frame. Yeah. Uh, so for 60 FPS, we want 16 milliseconds per frame, and we were running at about 6,000 milliseconds per frame. But to understand what went wrong here, we need to talk about how Svelte stores global state. It uses objects known as stores, uh, similar to Redux which are basically just data containers that you can attach a listener to. Uh, if you're familiar with like Java Beans, it's a bit like an observable. Some, some are writable, some are readable. There's a whole kind of ecosystem there. But for our purposes, a Svelte component subscribes to a store. Whenever the value in the store changes, the component gets re-rendered. And stores can also subscribe to stores. So uh, this, is known as a, uh, this is known as a derived store. The one on the left is derived from the one on the right. For example, if this store stored the amount of stock that we had for a certain type of uh, a certain type of uh, chocolate bar in our shop, then we could derive from that whether or not we're out of stock. So if it's zero, it's out of stock. And whenever this value changes, we have to recompute the store on the left based on that function. And it's also possible to derive one store from multiple. For example, if each of these stored the stock of one chocolate bar and their price, this one could calculate the total worth of all of our chocolate bar inventory. So what had Stevie done when writing this global state management? Well, he had one main store down here, which stored the entire board, every single cell. And from there, he derived one store per cell. So this one would select cell one from the main store, and then the component for cell one would subscribe to that derived store. Uh, whenever a cell got revealed, we sent an update to the main store. We said, hey, cell one's been revealed, and obviously it changed its value. Because that one had changed its value, we needed to look at everything that was derived from that store. So all of these, and these 10,000 more for the remaining 10,000 cells. That was 10,000 function invocations, and each one of those was accessing an index of a 10,000 element array. It, it wasn't fast, and then of course, after all that, one cell actually updates. That's what I call deriving top down, and you can tell it's bad, so I'll put it in like a bad font. <laughs> Deriving top-down is when you've got lots of small stores derived from one big one. And as we've seen, that can be really inefficient. But a better alternative is deriving bottom-up, written in a nice font. I'm wasted as a developer. <laughs> deriving bottom-up is when you've got one big store derived from lots of little stores. So the difference is, when the arrows are going this way, and we're deriving small stores from big, the big store is the source of truth. The other way, these small stores are the source of truth. Um, and you're probably looking at this thing, that doesn't look like bottom up, that looks like right to left. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> bottom up! <laughs> I, can, I think of it like a pyramid, because you've got lots of small ones. Anyway, that's exactly what Stevie did. He changed it so that instead of deriving top down, he derived bottom up. Which meant that it looked like this, which is basically the same. This arrow points the opposite direction. But now, whenever we update a cell, we send that update to the cell one store because that's the source of truth for information about cell one. That triggers an update in cell one, which then propagates through just the bits that actually get affected. All of these 9,999 remaining stores haven't had to do anything, because we've kind of statically told the app that this is the way that the dependencies work. So what was different? When deriving top-down, an update to one cell triggered 10,001 store updates. But when deriving bottom-up, it only triggered two and they both had the same net effect. So Steve had slain the Svelte store optimization dragon, but what was the result? Let's have a look. So here is a, uh, a reworked version, which actually derives bottom up. And again, we will continue to refresh. I would have compiled you a version that was like actually gonna work, but there's six versions and I've kind of run out of time. We'll get there eventually. There we go. So you can see it's, it's quite a lot faster, to be honest. Saving each of those 10,000 store checks 
20 times a second, 60 times a second, makes it a lot faster. So, what was it in FPS? Well, it's a 1,100% 1, increase in speed. 23.3 FPS. It's a big improvement, but still a long way from that 60 FPS goal. What's slowing us down now? So, in the developer tools, we can see a lot of interesting things. First of all, the JavaScript doesn't take nearly as long. Um, but now we've got these two steps, the layout and the paint, which are both part of the HTML rendering pipeline. And just as a note, it looks like these have got bigger, but actually it's just the JavaScript is now so small that we've zoomed in and these were invisible before because it's that much faster. Um, so he dreaded it, but Stevie knew it was time to take on his biggest challenge yet. The cave of HTML rendering optimization. And he jumped right in. Showing no fear, Stevie came across the first fearsome beast, the unnecessary HTML layout. So the layout has taken quite a long time. Um, and actually, it looks like there's probably a way to get rid of it. But before we talk about that, we need to talk about what HTML layout is. And I'm giving you this amazing analogy. Imagine there's a line of people to the shops, and someone just pushes in the middle. We have to lay out everyone so that they can make space. Basically, that's what HTML layout is. <coughs> if we had a node in the middle of a grid, everything else might have to shift along. And the browser isn't sure whether or not that has to happen, so it has to do a layout and check. That happens in Stevie's app. Whenever a cell goes from being unknown to being known, either clear or flagged, because we're adding text into that node. Adding the text means we've added an HTML node, and the browser thinks, oh, this might have caused everything to move around. We know that it hasn't, because it's actually being overlaid on top, but the browser doesn't know that. Armed with this trusty friend, Google, CV discovered that actually, you can trigger paint if you change non-geometric properties, like background, text, color, or shadows, but these don't cause a layout. So we can change the color of text or the color of backgrounds, and that doesn't cause a layout. Adding the nodes does. But when we <coughs> statically generate that board at the start of the Minesweeper game, we know what text is going to be in every cell. We just don't display it. Because us, the, the, mines are, uh, the mines are organized on the board, and we know where they all are. Therefore, we know what every number is going to be. So instead of adding the text, we could just display it in a transparent color. And then when the cell gets revealed, rather than adding the text, display it in an opaque color so that it becomes visible. The beast was slain. Stevie had solved the unnecessary HTML layout. And let's have a look at how fast it is now. There we go. So that's actually quite a big improvement. You kind of can't tell because it's so fast, but we'll get the numbers. <laughs> so 36.5 FPS. That's a 57% speed up. And all that happened was instead of adding text, we now always display text just transparently. Can I go cheat and press F12 and see what's. <laughs> you absolutely can, and you can just highlight it as well, and it'll show up. <laughs> um, I think you might be able to change like opacity or something like that, or you can do CSS tricks to make it not selectable. But also, if we get to the very end, the final solution doesn't use that. And yeah, but we'll get there. So in the developer tools, that unnecessary layout step, which was shown in purple, is completely gone. And now this paint step is taking so much longer. Well, it's not. It's taking the same amount of time again. We've just zoomed in. But look at it. It's taking like, so much more time than everything else just to paint. So barely given a chance to recover after slaying that beast, Stevie encountered the even more fearsome, unnecessary paint complexity. But what is HTML painting? Is it when Chrome uses a paintbrush? No, not really. Um, painting is the final step in that pipeline. So the browser has decided where everything's going to be on the screen. So it's decided its position, and it knows what size it's all going to be, how it's all laid out. And all it needs to do is convert that kind of HTML DOM into some paint instructions and rasterize it into an image. Um, so why is that taking so long in Stevie's app? Well, each frame, we have to paint an 800 by 800 pixel area. We have to do that 60 times per second, eventually. And each one contains 30,000 paint steps. But what's a paint step? Is it that? No. The browser has to break down the painting into multiple small steps, where each step is something like paint a square, paint a rectangle, paint a circle, or paint some text. And each cell in Stevie's app has to paint three things, a square for the background, a kind of hollow square for the border, and then some text. 
for the middle, and then that creates one cell. It's 10,000 cells, so 30,000 paint steps, and each one of those takes a little bit of time. But how could we reduce that? Well, yeah, I guess we could just get rid of the borders and use a kind of checkerboard pattern instead. The dragon wasn't, wasn't dead, but it was certainly wounded. And let's have a look at how dead it is. Wounded it is, not dead. Okay. Yep, so after removing the borders, you can see this kind of checkerboard pattern. And there we go. So there it goes again, solving it. And again, it's a kind of fairly minor improvement, but we're getting so close to 60 FPS now that it's going to get harder to tell. And it gets 50.1 FPS. We're only 9.9 .9 off. If we round down, that's zero. That's a 37% improvement. Um, but you can see the paint is still taking a really long time. It's still the, the <coughs> slowest thing in that rendering pipeline. It wasn't enough to just reduce the paint complexity of each cell. We somehow had to reduce the amount of stuff being painted, the amount of cells being painted. Because whenever one cell got cleared, we had to repaint this entire board, even, even the bits that had stayed the same. Um, furious with rage, Stevie sliced the board into many small pieces, and suddenly we had HTML layers. So each of these small squares is one HTML layer containing a 10 by 10 thing of, uh, cells, therefore 1% of the board. What that means is that if a cell gets changed inside one of these layers, we only have to repaint that layer. Anything that hasn't changed can just be reused that same painting that we'd used before. So you've defeated the unnecessary paint complexity monster. And I'm excited for this one, so let's see the results of that. After adding these HTML layers, I'm going to really regret this. Never do anything that involves random chance. Look at how fast that is. Super speedy. So we've massively sped up that uh, paint step. And let's have a look at exactly how 60 FPS. I mean, you could probably tell. It's like butter. But let's have a look at just how fast it was. And you'll probably notice, first of all, that the JavaScript looks like it's taking a really long time again, which shows you just how much we've zoomed in. Each of these paint steps is about 1% uh, as big as the original one. And there are two of them because we've had to paint two layers. Uh, so instead of having this massive one that had all 100 layers, we've got these two for the two that actually needed repainting. Stevie was finally happy. He would achieved his goal. He, he yoked himself out of that cave of HTML rendering optimization. And he married a princess, and they, they all lived happily ever after. Uh, oh, what, what's happened? Does it? What have you <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Does, does, it doesn't work in Firefox. 30, 30 FPS it gets in Firefox, and it turns out that adding those layers actually made it slower. Um, no, it doesn't work in Firefox. Does, does it have to? Yes, please. That'd be great. Oh. This is what's known as a right inconvenience. But nonetheless, Stevie yoked himself back into the cave, and inside there was a terrifying beast. It was Chris Price. <laughs> and he said, you could always just use HTML canvas, and then you'd get full control over that rendering pipeline. You could choose exactly what gets painted, and it would work across browsers. And then he disappeared, revealing the even more terrifying beast, the evil unicorn of having to use HTML5 canvas for cross-browser compatibility. Not very catchy. Completely fed up at this point, Prince CVW just accepted his fate and he got on with it. Thankfully, the app wasn't very complicated. It was just a grid. Every cell was the same size. Nothing moved around. There was no interactivity. And when it comes to HTML5 Canvas, it doesn't really get any simpler than that. So he just did it. He gritted his teeth and he pulled out his gun and he just shot the unicorn. And it was done. He'd implemented it in HTML5 Canvas. He'd so whenever a cell changed, only that bit of the canvas gets overwritten. And suddenly, it works in Firefox, which I can't show you because Firefox isn't on this laptop. But you can try it out for yourself. Wait for the last slide. Um, so here it is in HTML5 Canvas. And <laughs> that did work. It just it got to a point where it couldn't solve anymore. Um, we'll hopefully get one where it actually solves a lot so you can see it going. And wait, at this point, you actually can't select the text. So, ooh, ooh look, nothing. Because it is just an image, essentially, getting progressively painted. So there it is, running an HTML5 canvas. And finally, we get 60 FPS in both Chrome and Firefox. DevTools 
shows no pain step up here because it's all being done on the GPU directly. So not only is it cross-browser compatible, but I've made GPU accelerated Minesweeper. Sorry, Stevie has, not me. Does it work in Firefox? Hell yeah, it does. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening. Um, I wrote a blog post on this. It came out on Monday and it's a little bit more technical if you are interested in that kind of stuff. You can try it out for yourself at optimization.stephenbordman.uk. I forgot my own name then. Um, and do look up the hero's journey because I put a lot of effort into that, into making that exactly the same narrative arc as like the Iliad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? If you don't, I'd be concerned. Yes. Um, so when you did the step to add the HTML, like the, you grouped the 10 by 10, I don't know. Yes, what, what, what HTML layers. layers. Was there a reason for choosing 10? Like, it, does it get too complicated if you do like tiny ones, or is it more, is it just inefficient? Yeah. So I've actually skipped out a couple of steps in the HTML rendering pipeline. After um, painting, where we paint each layer, there's a step called layer compositing. So each mm. layer, you imagine it's like a 10 by 10 image. We have to combine them all into one 800 by 800 image. Um, so if you have too many of those, that step becomes incredibly slow. Um, and I just kind of, by trial and error, tried different sizes and found that that 10 by 10 worked quite nicely. It's also worth mentioning that you're sh they don't have to be squares as long as they're rectangles. I could have had long rows, but because a cell generally affects the ones around it in all directions, a square mm -hmm. made sense to reduce the kind of the number of times that one cell would affect across yeah. a layer, because obviously that's twice as expensive. Yeah? Does it work on Opera? <laughs> does. does it work on mobile? <laughs> it does work on mobile. It basically, anything that last one, anything that runs HTML5 Canvas will work. And I think pretty much everything supports HTML5 Canvas. Might not work on the Wii browser. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God I wasn't targeting that. Um, yeah, and Svelte just works on everything because it compiles down to plain JavaScript. Um, I think it's just kind of common script as well. It's not like it's not like a, a more recent one, so it should work basically on anything. Any other questions? Did you try it on GPU-heavy hardware, as in a PC with graphic card? No. no. Um, I think by the time I got to 60 FPS, I was happy. Um, <laughs> at home, I've got a 165 FPS monitor, and I just flat out refused, because at this point, I was fed up with Minesweeper. Um, but a GPU-heavy, it probably wouldn't make that much of a difference. You could improve the performance a lot more by, um, so I was using Svelte components for each cell. Even though I was using Canvas, they weren't actually displaying anything. They were just sending requests to that Canvas. Just having one <coughs> controller which fired the requests and had a solver all built in would have been a lot faster. But I started this project to learn Svelte and learn about optimization, and it would have been a bit pointless to kind of strip all that out for the purpose of making it go faster when I was already fast enough. Your, your last solution that uh, worked in Firefox and gave you 50 FPS, what does it give you in Chrome? The, the HTML5 Canvas one? Yeah. Uh, that gives you 60 FPS in everything. Okay. Um, it, do, it doesn't like go up to 120 in Chrome? It probably will, but Chrome won't render it any higher frame rate than your monitor has. Um, so at home I could have tried on my monitor, but I don't want to open that can of worms because I think 60 FPS will target 99% of people. Not going to give myself a lot. So it's yeah. a bottleneck now that JavaScript. Yes. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So I you, think could actually. Could you migrate it across to WebAssembly? <laughs> 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 yes, you totally could. Um, and yeah, actually, so the while it's running at 60 FPS, I think that the amount of time the rendering pipeline takes changes the amount of steps of solving that it does in each frame. So I'm a little bit. I think actually the layers one in Chrome is a little bit faster than the HTML5 Canvas one because it, it's a, the rendering is faster, therefore it solves it faster because it can do more JavaScript mm. steps. If you do it on WebAssembly, it'll probably just do it in one step. Like one <laughs> frame is just done. It's not a very complex algorithm. Um, and it's not as powerful as a lot of other solvers that exist. It just kind of does the basic stuff. Because the main thing I was worried about was A Svelte and B rendering. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much.